We've already talked about complexity and competition. Okay, so if you look at the business environment, 20 to 30 years ago, products and markets, the ANSOF area, less competitive, of course, compared to today, highly competitive products and markets. The technology was a steady improvement to rapidly change in these days. Take, for example, the simple thing like writing a, a letter. Okay, I mean, for a long time, it was a feather, I think. And then we had the fountain pen. Then about in, over the 18th century, end of the 18th century, we had the first typewriters coming in. And then we had the first electric typewriters about the 1960s. <coughs> then about the 1970s, we had the first golf ball typewriter from IBM. Anyone remembers or knows what a golf ball typewriter is? Okay, some people are nodding their head. It was a typewriter where the, all the letters and symbols were on a golf ball, and you, so you could, uh, it used to spin around and hit the paper, and you had, of course, you could carry in a little box your Times New Roman, your Arial, your Mathematics, and you change the golf balls. Okay, now that was a quite an improvement to the old typewriter that was hitting the pages like this. But that lasted only less than 10 years when the first dedicated word processors came out from people like Wang. And that time it was a hardware solution, but then today, of course, it is all software. Okay, you can see that by the time you have got some program, it is already out of date. So it's rapidly changing. Now, despite all of that, those who have a laptop in front of you, if you look at the keyboard, you will see the word QWERTY, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, as the first letters of the, uh, in, in the keyboard. Why is it Q-W-E-R-T-Y and not A-B-C-D-E? Any ideas? Yes? Yeah, you're right, you're the first student in what, two, at least 20,000 who knew the correct answer, okay? Most people say because it is faster to do QWRT, in fact, quite the opposite. It was designed to slow things down because the typewriter keys are getting stuck to each other. So, well, but it's not being used, in, okay? So still today, our, our uh, typewriters and annoyingly, this BlackBerry, which is the most annoying product I ever have used, is still the QWERT, okay? So we are having these faster speeds and so on that we're looking for our computer, but the keyboard is to make things slow. Okay, so that's the interesting thing. Are you an engineer by any chance? Okay, <laughs> okay. Let, let me ask you then a different question. Let's see if you know the answer to this one. Why is it that the rail tracks are not a standard dimension but it's a very odd dimension, the rail tracks that you get in a railway line. Why is that? Because the rail tracks were put on top of cart tracks in the old days. Okay, the rail track was laid on top of a cart track. So why were the cart tracks that distance? Because they were laid on top of chariot tracks of the Roman Empire. So why were chariot tracks that distance? because that was the distance of two horses' backsides, okay? So today, okay, the two horses that went in the chariots, the wheels were there, so today our latest bullet trains are running on tracks that were built for two horses. Okay, so these are the interesting <coughs> little things about technology. Okay, information systems are fa fairly rudimentary in the old days. I mean, when I, 20, 30 years ago, was the start of trying to put some simple accounting packages, some payrolls and so on into the, into the system. Today, MRPs, ERPs, SAPs and so on, highly sophisticated. Economy was domestic, very much domestic. You sold to people around you. Today, it is global and less regulated. 
interestingly, when I was thinking about uh, redoing these notes, I thought about this less regulated. That was in the old notes as well. And of course, because it was less regulated, we had the global financial crisis. And we were promised by people like Obama that they are going to regulate the economy. But from what you see, it is still less regulated. Still the same guys who are running the, who are running the economy before the global financial crisis seem to be running it now. Okay? I, I would uh, urge you to go and watch, uh, take the DVD called Inside Job and watch it. It's all about what happened to the global financial crisis and beyond. Inside Job, it is fascinating. And clearly, they haven't yet regulated enough the uh, economy. It is still most likely out of control. Okay, so that's the economy. The financial markets, less competitive, stable. Today, highly competitive, volatile. Okay, even though the global financial crisis has come and gone and subprimes are no more, there are other things that are happening that makes it extremely volatile, especially the fiscal, fiscal cliff of the America. The fiscal cliff simply means that America passed a legislation long years ago that beyond a certain num figure in trillions, they will not issue more currency or borrow more. And so Obama and crowd have been printing, printing, printing US dollars. And it has come to a situation where they are coming to this uh, regularity limit that they never thought they'll exceed. So the fiscal cliff simply means that if they pass legislation, they can start printing money and increasing their debt. Okay, so the Republicans are against it. The Democrats are saying, let's, let's uh, increase the debt level, and so on. So this is where the current problem is. Okay, but it's difficult for even a top-level economist who write in the newspapers to understand what's happening with the economy. We're having a country that is printing US dollars, but there's no inflation. Normally, when you print money in countries like Brazil and, and Germany after the war, in Brazil in the 1970s, the money is not worth anything. Uh, also, what is this, um, uh, Zimbabwe. I mean, you get your salary in the morning, it's worth half in the afternoon, right? So why is it not happening with the US dollar at the moment? So they're printing the US dollar, paying off China for its products. China doesn't know what to do with it. So it is going, going back to the United States and buying its treasury bonds and its real estate. Okay, so when is this going to happen? We don't know. Britain has just announced yesterday that it's again into recession. Okay, so never happened before in a century. Yes, so they are, America is saying it doesn't matter. We can borrow as much as we like. And the other countries are saying, yes, because if America stops, all their economies also will go down. So this is why it is very, very, it's difficult to understand what's going to happen. I mean, you know, when is it all going to collapse? The, the consumer debt of America in terms of its credit card, okay, is twice as much as the average salaries. Average credit card debt is twice as much as the average salaries. In other words, the American public is never going to be able to ever pay back its credit card debt. So where is it all going? Okay, difficult to understand. Hope I won't be around. Okay, but some of our children might be. Okay, now shareholder, that's the last of the, uh, what we're gonna look at. About 20, 30 years ago, they allowed the companies to do what they wanted. You bought shares, you often got your shares from your grandmother, you kept it in the bottom drawer. If you, get, if you got your dividends good, if you didn't, so what? Okay, you didn't sell and this sort of thing. Today, uh, the shareholders are sophisticated, powerful, and challenging. We have uh, big pension funds who are into the share market. They're going and to AGMs asking unnecessary, you know, questions from, not necessarily, but hard questions from the, the directors. There are individual investors who are able to go online and start trading. And you have day traders, all of these people. And today, of course, there's a new breed of trading called algo trading. Have you heard of that? Trading based on algorithm, a computer mathematical algorithm, that there's no human involvement at all. These computers are mathematically doing essentially day trading 
based on equations. Okay, huge area. They're trying to control it, but difficult. Okay, so they can easily manipulate lots of computers to go together and start buying and trading to move markets. Okay, so that is the business environment we are facing today. The other area is, of course, competition and industry structure. You have the five forces model in more detail with you. So we have this complexity and competition at our doorstep. So given that, what about how we report our performance? If you look at our financial statements, what is the link between the financial statements? We have already got the balance sheet. The balance sheet is how a company obtains its funds and uses that funds to buy its assets. That is the balance sheet. And then we have the income statement, essentially where the company shows you how over a period of uh, time, usually a year, how it made use of these assets to earn a return to the company. So this is the income statement. Income statement. And we had sales. less cost of sales. That gives you gross profit. And from gross profit, we take away um, operating expenses. Okay, excluding depreciation and amortization. And that gives you what is called EBITDA, earnings before interest, uh, tax, depreciation, and amortization. From there, we take away depreciation and amortization. Amortization is your Intangible assets, amortization, and we get the famous EBIT, earnings before interest and tax. And from EBIT, we take away interest, and we get net profit before tax. And from net profit before tax, we take away tax. And we get net profit after tax, called NPAT, net profit after tax. <coughs> and from net profit after tax, we take away dividends paid to shareholders. And we get retained earnings. So this return earnings is added on to equity and the balance sheet balances. So remember I told you the nicest feeling, the greatest feeling for a financial accountant is when the balance sheet balances. We add the retained earnings to the equity. So this is essentially what accountants do, they show us how they got the money from shareholders and debt holders, what they used the money to buy in terms of assets, fixed assets and working capital, and how they worked this and got a return from it. So there are lots of different definitions of return. Gross profit, EBITDA, EBIT, net profit before tax, net profit after tax. So it is important for our evaluation of financial statements to separate finance from operations. Okay, so we would make sure that our finance is separated from operations. Now in Australia, because Australian financial statements and um, standards ask us to report on how the shareholders are doing, 
we have equity on one side and all of the liabilities, including the long-term liabilities, is put on the other side. So we are reporting the value of the company to the equity shareholders. But what we need to do for purposes of finance and for us to do some evaluation is to have debt and equity on one side and your, all your other liabilities on the other side. Okay, so this is what we have done. We have shown you the current liabilities deducted from the current assets. Okay, so this is final equation. Debt and equity, okay, is equal to working capital, which is current assets minus current liabilities, plus non-current assets, which is the fixed assets. Okay, so if you have set up your equation or your country's accounting standards, show you, uh, I'll allow you to show it this way, then that's fine. So once you set up your balance sheet, then you have to look at some detailed measures of performance. Now what I showed you here in terms of performance is called absolute measures. Absolute measures is in dollars or in dirham, okay? So we have sales turnover, gross profit, EBITDA, et cetera. All of that in terms of dollars, even your economic value added, your EVA calculation, which I have shown you already as residual income, your EVA calculation. <coughs> Where is that? Okay. Over here. The EVA calculation, you can see, is in dollars, okay? And also, you have your net present value figures, which you have done already some calculations on net present value. That will also be in dollars, okay? So net present value, and later on tomorrow, I'm going to introduce you to two concepts called strategic value and business value. When we are going to value a company, that's also going to be in dollars. Okay, so these are absolute measures. The problem with absolute measures, however, is that it is difficult for you to compare different companies and divisions of different sizes. So if you have a large company in Dubai making thousands and thousands of dirham profit, and you compare it to a corner grocery store that is making hundreds of profits, does it mean that the thousands of profits are better than hundreds of profits? No. It all means it, you have to find out what is the assets that they use to make that profit. So what we do is we divide one number by the other to compare companies and divisions of different sizes. In other words, we control for size, and that is relative measures. So you've already come across the relative measures. Here's a two-branch DuPont ratio tree, where we divide the return by the capital employed or investment and we have these branches. This is called the comprehensive ratio, and if you have set up your balance sheet where the investment and the capital is the same, ROI should equal ROC or return on capital employed. So the next level is your return on sales, which is your profit margin, and this asset turnover ratio. Okay, so that is the DuPont ratio tree. So you have seen different versions of this Okay, in your notes here, you can see a ratio tree growing sideways. Okay, this is the DuPont ratio tree. The tree is going sideways. And you will see that this particular branch here starts off, you look at the profit and loss account compared to balance sheet item, but when it gets down here, you have current assets upon current liabilities and so on, the quick ratio. So these are all relative measures. Okay, now we can compare divisions of, and companies of different sizes. But when you're doing that, you have to be careful. Okay, the advantages are good, but there are some concerns as well. Advantages are, it blends in one number all the major ingredients of profitability. Sales, cost, investment, and capital employed. As you can see, in one number, all of these finally come to this number. The ROI, ROC statistic by itself, can be compared with opportunities elsewhere. So you can do both, in, both inside and outside the company. In other words, you can do intersegmental and interfirm comparisons. 
but you've got to be careful. You have to ask questions such as, what do we mean by return? And what do we mean by capital employed? So let's look at that one first. Okay. So here we're going to test out your knowledge of finance now. What do we mean by return and what do we mean by capital employed? So let's do that now. Okay, so my rogue statistic number one. Okay, I'm going to take my total capital employed. So from my balance sheet, I'm going to take my total capital employed of 300. By the way, I'll give you some terminology that the finance people use. Total capital employed, they use the term V for the value of the company. Equity, they use the term S for shares. And debt, they use the term B for borrowings. Okay, now, these are not my terms. These are terms that you find in the finance textbooks. Okay, so if your, if your denominator is total capital of V, Okay, which of course means it is shares plus equity, what should my numerator be from my income statement? What should my numerator be? Okay, which return figure? The question is, if my rogue statistic uses total capital employed, what should be my numerator. Profit before tax? No. EBIT is getting close. Okay, now let me give you the clue. It should be the figure that is pertaining to giving a return for both shareholders and debt holders. Earnings, net profit, did you say before tax? Net profit before tax has only shareholders after that. So from this, you only, you're only paying shareholders. No, net profit after tax is even worse because that's only for shareholders. Gross profit is too high because you have all these operating expenses that have nothing to do with shareholders or debt holders. Someone mentioned EBIT. EBIT is good. EBIT is good because from EBIT, you're paying your debt holders and you're paying your shareholders. But there's one other guy there that is not part of V. Who is that? Tax. Okay, so what we need to do is to either add back tax, okay, or remove tax, add back tax to net profit before tax, sorry, add back interest, or deduct tax from EBIT. So the term we use is EBITDA earnings before interest, but after tax. Not EBITDA, what am I saying? Earnings before interest, uh, tax, no, 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 this is not right. I'm getting, okay. Yeah, so it is earnings before interest, but after tax. So E-B-I-A-T, that's right, E-B-I-A-T. It's getting too late in the day here. Okay, let me do that again. Earnings before interest, but after tax. That's correct. That will be my denominator. So I have to, from this figure, I have to deduct tax to get at my EBIT. Okay? So now from this figure, I can pay my shareholders and my debt holders. Okay, now let's continue. If you have of course, no tax involved, then it's easier. V will be EBI. Okay, this figure will be called EBI because there will be no tax to pay. Next one. 
what if my denominator is only shares, only equity? What if my denominator is only shares? So this is return on equity. What should my numerator be? Capital? If my denominator is only shares, what should my return be from this dot here? Remember the rule? The one on top, the numerator must pertain to only the capital below. So which one? Before tax? Before tax has the tax fellow. After tax. That's easy. So from this figure, we have only now shareholders. No tax, no interest, nothing. So this NPAT is called equity profit. And given the notation E by finance people, equity profit, E. So over here, it will be equity profit or NPAT, net profit after tax. OK? Right, one more. What if my return is my borrowings, my debt? Then which figure from there? Be careful, it's a trick question. If my denominator is debt, what should my numerator be? Return, what is the return on debt? Thank you. Interest. That's what I said is a trick question. Interest paid. Interest would be my numerator. Okay, that is 100% of the money that we are paying and we have to pay to our debt holders. But this is, okay, now some of the terminology. This is called KO, cost of overall cost of capital. That is called cost of equity. And this is called cost of debt before tax. Okay. So if you want to have the cost of debt after tax, cost of debt after tax equals cost of debt before tax, one minus the tax rate. Because you are allowed to deduct interest before tax. So you can adjust for tax. OK. Yes? Sorry, average? Yeah, there is some issues there that if the share capital at the beginning is different to the share capital at the end, what do you do? OK, you can, if you want to do the average, you can add the two and divide, add the beginning balance and the ending balance and divide by two. That will give you average. There are those issues as well, but for the moment, you keep it as this. OK? OK. Now, a small question here. Earlier, I said return. Now I'm saying cost. Why? Why am I using the same term terminology, return and cost, with the same equation? Easy answer. Sorry? Yeah, so why am I saying cost? And then I say R, return. Sorry? Don't understand? Very good. Mirror image. You're absolutely right. The return is what the shareholder is wanting. The cost is what is for the company. It's simply the return to the shareholder is a cost for the company. So if you use the word return, we're talking about shareholders. If you're talking about cost, you're talking about company. That is why I didn't use return here. It's only cost. Because the shareholder return or debt holder return is the interest. But for the company, because you can deduct tax, the cost of debt after tax would be less than the cost of debt before tax. Any questions with all this? OK, so the point is that even with a sophisticated audience like yourself, you can see that there's often confusion. 
you can divide any number by any number, but does it make sense? So you have to be careful that you align your numerator to your denominator. Okay, if you're doing return on equity, you must only have net profit after tax. If you're looking at all of capital, then take away the tax person, except in a no tax situation. It's a tax holiday company. Okay. Next one is that the return on capital employee may be measured with different values. That is also a possibility because the return figure is last year's return and the capital employee, especially if you look at this side, investment side has assets of different periods. So ideally, you must use the financing side and use these at market <coughs> values to get the correct view of cost. Third issue that you have to be careful about is that segment managers may ignore overall company objectives in order to retain high rocks. So let's look at an example of that. Here are two companies, company A and company B. Both are earning the same EBIT, but one of them has debt, other one has no debt. I have a perfect company now to talk about no debt, Apple. Apple has, is an all equity company now, no debt. Okay, so in this case, if your debt is 8% debentures, then from the 200,000, you can deduct the 8% 8 of 100,000 interest. So your EBIT, EBT will be different. Your tax, 50%. Note immediately that you've got a tax advantage. You pay less taxes for company A. And so and so forth. So you will see that, in fact, if you look at one of the calculations, the first one, you see that both companies <coughs> performed equally. But the second case, you see that if you use return on equity capital, it appears that company A has performed better than company B. But have they? Both have done exactly the same in terms of operations. But because company A has got itself geared or levered, it appears to do better for shareholders. <coughs> but really, it has put the company at risk. That is what has happened. OK. So you've got to be careful that you're not going to penalize the manager for com operational manager for company B with a financing issue of your leverage. Right. Therefore, the measures chosen should differentiate between financing and investment or operating decisions. The financing decision concerns what long-term source of financial assets were chosen. This involves taking risks by borrowing money at a fixed interest rate with the expectation that of earning a higher rate of return on such funds. The investment decision concerns the acquisition and utilization of assets. This involves taking risks by investing the funds in projects that have high returns. So we must not confuse the two, must keep it separate. Okay, so now let's look at cost of capital and performance-based valuation. The cost of capital is a combined rate of return required by both lenders and shareholders. It's the minimum acceptable return on economic investment as a cutoff rate required for value creation. The cost of capital drivers are all about the trade-off between risk and reward. The greater the risk, the greater the required return and cost of capital. In summary, the cost of capital is the return on capital required to have sufficient funds to pay interest after tax on debt which is KD, which we've now found out, KD, and provide an acceptable return on equity, KE, return on equity. Okay, now, the cost of debt, easy to compute. You know what your borrowings are, you know what interest that you're paying. So you can easily calculate cost of debt after tax rate the business would have to pay in the current market to obtain long-term debt capital you know what the tax rate is. But cost of equity is a more abstract thing. The component, this component of cost of capital is more abstract as it is based upon alternative investment yields of comparable risk. 
The cost of equity varies by industry and company, reflecting the market's expectation of risk. Cost of equity has three equivalent definitions. The minimum acceptable rate of return, which equity owners or investors expect to earn each year. The minimum rate of return, which business must earn to be economically profitable, which is the last one that we're going to make use of, the appropriate rate to use for discounting future equity cash flows. Now that is important for tomorrow when we are going to value a company, okay? To use for the discount rate. Okay. So if you bring the two together, that's the cost of debt and the cost of equity, you get KO, which is your weighted average cost of capital. Managers need to understand that equity capital employed in a business is not free from tax, for, uh, not free of cost. The weighted cost of capital provides a hurdle rate, evaluating rates of return on new capital projects financed by both equity and debt. It uses the financing side of the balance sheet in the form of the targeted debt to total capital ratio to provide the basis of weighting the cost of debt and equity capital to calculate your WAC. So we have already done a simple calculation of WAC, as you can see here. On the first day itself, we looked at WAC. If you have these at market values ideally, now later on I've, I've shown you a little bit about how to get the cost of equity and the cost of debt, but we'll discuss that further. But if you have these numbers, then 10% times two upon three, two upon three, plus 5% times one upon three, gives you roughly 8%, somewhere in between. This would be the weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so you will see in this equation here, in this uh, calculation here, that my costs are the same as my costs I used on the first day, 10% and 5%. My weightage is the same, two thirds and one third, but my value is different, okay? It's 100,000 versus 200,000, doesn't matter. If the weights are the same and the rates or costs are the same, the WAC will turn out to be the same, okay? So that's a simple WAC calculation. Now I still haven't shown you how to do cost of equity. I've shown you how to do cost of debt, that's very easy. Interest divided by the cost of the, the value and adjusted for tax. So the weighted average cost of capital calculated as follows. The cost of debt is the cost of debt before tax. After tax is the cost of debt before tax, one minus the tax. I've shown you how to do that. The problem is the cost of equity. Now initially, up to about the 1980s, what finance books had was the dividend valuation model to calculate cost of equity. They made the simplifying assumption that companies pay dividends on a growth rate, that there's a constant growth rate of dividends, that the next period's dividend is the current dividend, one plus the growth rate, so that's a compounding rate, and then they worked on this equation to calculate cost of equity based on a constant growth rate of dividend. Okay, it was okay till about the 1980s, but we knew there were lots of problems with it, mainly because companies don't have a constant growth rate of dividends. They sometimes pay dividends, sometimes they don't, sometimes they pay less dividends than last year, and so on. So that model really was not reality. So then we came up in the 1980s, the model that actually was good, and that was the capital asset pricing model. The capital asset pricing model. So let me, now in your notes you have great discussion of it, but I'm going to put it to you simply. First of all, as a matter of interest, how many of you have come across the capital asset pricing model? I'm sure some of the younger people should have come across, yes? CAPM, anyone else? CAPM, no? Oh, you have, but you don't remember it. Okay, so let's look at this. I'm not going to go through the CAPM in detail because that will take you at least seven days. I'm going to give you the key points of the CAPM, and often that may be enough for you to understand it. Okay, so first of all, okay, this is the 
we are going to look at the movement of the share price of a company compared to the whole stock market. So this is the stock market in Dubai. And this is a company in Dubai. Give me a name of a listed company in Dubai. Sorry? OK. Yeah. Emma. OK, so this is the percentage return of Emma. And this is the percentage return of the whole market. OK, so in one particular period, let us say that the market went up by 10%, plus 10%. Emma went up by 5% only in that period. So you have a point over here. In another period, the market actually fell by 10%. But Emma went up by 10%. OK, so we have a point over here, minus 10% and plus 10%. So like that, over a period of time, we can plot the movement of Emma against the market. And you will find that it will be something in this direction. By and large, when the market goes up, the company goes up. And when the market falls, the company falls. Around here, you could get a situation where the company falls a bit, and the market falls when the company goes up. But by and large, it's in this direction. You won't get it in that direction. Okay, In that direction, it means that your company is going against the market. You don't find that very often, or not at all. In fact, as a joke, I say, maybe undertaking firms, you know, the ones who bury people. Because if the stock market crashes, all the stockbrokers jump out of the windows and kill themselves. And therefore, the business of undertaking goes up. But in reality, you won't find it like that. So now you draw a line of best fit. And there is theoretical reasons why the line will go very close to or at zero point. So this angle here, this angle, if it is 45 degrees, if it is 45 degrees, we tell that this company has a beta or coefficient of 1. OK, so we use the equation y equals mx plus c. y equals the y-axis, which is the percentage return of emma. m equals the gradient or beta. x is the x-axis of the market. And c, we to, as I told you, is the intercept that goes very close to 0. So uh, beta or coefficient of 1 means this, that if you have plot the uh, company over time, percentage return over time, then if the market moves plus 10%, minus 10% over time like this, okay, the company will actually follow the market, by and large. It will follow the market. Company goes up by 10%. By and large, a beta 1 means the market goes up by 10%. The company goes up by 10%. So this is a beta of 1. OK, now we do another company. We're not supposed to do it on the same scale, but I'll use it. Give me another company in the, on the stock market. Dubai 1, is it on the stock market? It is a lot, OK. OK. So in this case, let us say that we had a line like this, halfway. So it is a lot. This one is a beta of 0.5. In other words, if the market goes up by 10%, this company goes up by only 5%. But the market falls by 10%, it falls by only 5%. So a much flatter line, OK, a beta of 0.5, which means it's a stable, stable share. Doesn't go up too much in certain time, doesn't fall too much, a beta of 0.5. And now we do a third company, OK, third company. And let us say we have a, beat, uh, a gradient like this. Now, you might say that is 1.5, because after all, 
this is 0.5, that's one. Halfway there, 1.5, no. It starts rapidly increasing of this point. This will be beta of two, because as it comes to here, you're getting a beta of infinity. So in that case, the market goes up by 10%, this goes up by 20%, and the market falls, it falls by 20%. So beta of two, volatile. Okay, now, is there any questions up to this point? Okay, now these can be done earlier when we used to do these plots, we used to do it every year, then we became every quarter, then every month, then every day, now we can plot this every minute. I am not, I mean one less than infinity is one less than infinity, I don't know what number that is. Okay, infinity is forever. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you would probably not, I mean when you're going here, it rapidly increases and, and here you will not find anything. Okay, which, which is completely a stock that is absolutely out of control, not have anything to do with the market. Okay, so we, we really wouldn't worry about that too much. Okay? But usually we don't have these Why not? You do have very, very, very volatile stock. We do have that. Okay? So, uh, but beyond two, three, four, probably not. Okay? So that would be the, okay, now, do all of you agree that you can do this for every company on the Dubai stock market? Okay. So now comes the next one. The next one is that we are going to start choosing our portfolio. We don't want to have only one stock. We want to have more than that. So we'll look at number of different companies. And this is number of different companies, and this is total risk of the portfolio given by the, the standard deviation. Okay, so you all can well understand, even those who are not mathematical, that if you have only one company, then the entire risk of that company you are taking. If the company does well, you have positive standard deviation. If the company collapses, you have negative. So I think, I don't know the Arabic translation or the other language translation, but in English it says, do not put all your eggs in one basket. Okay, same. Okay. So essentially, have two shares at least. If one basket falls, the other one is there. So by having two, you can reduce your risk by having three, you can reduce your risk even more. So you can keep reducing the risk until after some time, no matter how many different companies you have in your all the different baskets, you cannot reduce risk anymore. Okay, what is left is, is market risk. So you can get rid of non-market risk, also called unsystematic risk, by investing in more than one company, but you're going to be left with market risk after some point. My question now is, how many different companies need you put into your portfolio of companies to have to get rid of non-market risk? Anyone remember? What is the minimum number you need to have to get rid of non-market risk? 10, 15, 20, 300, 1,000, how many? Different companies. Of course, if you put the entire Dubai Stock Exchange into your portfolio, you've got it on non-market risk. But you may not need to put the entire stock market into your portfolio. In other words, buy every company in the stock market. How many companies do you buy? You're yeah, right. The different industries that you have would reduce the risk. So randomly selected. How many randomly selected shares would you need? Anyone? Take a guess. No, randomly selected. We are not going to look at performance at the moment. 30? I heard 10? Well, actually, 
it's about 15, 15 to 20. That's it. If you have 15 to 20 different companies that you're investing in, you got rid of non-market risk. So what does this mean? This means that you open the Gulf News to the finance section, take a pin, close your eyes, 15 times you press, okay, open, find other companies that you've pressed, invest in them. Don't worry about performance and trend analysis and all of that. You've got rid of non-market risk. What do you think? Yes. This class is amazing. You're telling things. Uh, before I tell, you're telling. You're right. <laughs> you're right. In Australia, I don't know about the United States, in Australia they played a game for the last five years where they've got a schoolboy, they've got an astrologer, a sportsman, a TV personality, two financial investors who are professionals, and a monkey throwing a darts at a dartboard that is turned. Over the last three years, the monkey has most often won. <laughs> so all your investment analysts, what are you paying them for? He's the CEO. <laughs> so you know about it, yeah. Monkey, in fact, they tried to blindfold the monkey, and he got even better results. We're throwing the darts with a blindfold. So a blindfolded monkey can do well better than your investment analysts. OK? So go and look at the Financial Times game that they play. It's quite embarrassing for those. I mean, some weeks, the dartboard doesn't win, but overall, the dartboard won. OK, so now, so we've chosen our 16 companies. Now we may have to open our eyes a little bit for the next model. OK, how are you doing? Are you understanding what we have done up to now? So I now invested in 16 companies. But now I want to sort of take away the problem companies and put the good ones in. But all the time I have 16. OK, all the time I must have 16. So now I use the capital asset pricing model. Okay. So here, it is still my equation of y equals mx plus c. But my Y would be percentage return on a particular share of a company. But my X will be market risk. Not total risk, but market risk. Why not total risk? Because I'm having 16. So I got rid of non-market risk. I'm left with only market risk. And market risk is given by the beta calculation. OK? So now my x-axis becomes my beta. OK, so what this tells you is that if you have a risk-free security, like you've invested in the treasury bills, no market risk, that with the risk-free security, if you are investing in the market itself, the whole stock market index, you'll have the return on the market, which will have a market risk. And how much would the market risk be? By definition, it has to be 1. Why? Beta of 1 moves along with the market. So if I had put market here and market here, you'd have the perfect straight line, Okay, a beta of 1 at 45 degrees. So combine these two points, and you get something called the security market line. So in equilibrium, all shares must lie on this line. If you're beta, let us take the case of um, Etisalad. If Etisalad's beta is 0.5, it should be giving you a return on the market of so much. Right, so what we do is now we look at this security market line to make decisions if to invest in something or sell something. Okay, now I want you all to forget about the share market for a minute and look at this concept of a percentage return. Percentage return, let us say return on a 
condominium project in Dubai in the good times. Okay. Percentage return. Let us say that you have invested in the condominium and there is a set cash flow or rental that you get from that condominium. So we keep the cash flow constant or rental. Now if you invested in it, okay, have a look at this now. If you had a friendly real estate agent who sold you the condominium at a price that is less than market value, what will happen to your return? It will go up, right? So you can see the percentage return is a inverse relationship to your price or investment. On the other hand, if your investment you you were played out by your agent who charged you more, then your percentage return, other things being equal, will come down. So there's an inverse relationship. Okay, so using that principle, if you find that etisalad percentage return is actually above the, the return that is expected for the security market line, is that overpriced or underpriced? Have a look at that. It is underpriced. If the investment is low, the return is high. This is getting a return higher than it should for the level of risk. So it is underpriced. So what should you do? Buy it. buy it. If you don't have it, buy it. On the other hand, if you had another company, let us say with a with a beta of 1.5, but the company return is over here, it is not getting a return that it should be getting. Is that overpriced or underpriced? Overpriced, because the return is below, which means the price is high. So overpriced, so if you have it in your portfolio of 16, quickly sell. You see, this is how you buy and sell to get the maximum out of your portfolio. So what happens? As more and more people buy this, the price will go up, the return will come down to equilibrium. As more and more people sell this, the price will go down and the return will go up to equilibrium. So these sort of differences are called arbitrage profit. You see the disequilibrium and you quickly buy. That's what day traders are doing all the time. Okay, disequilibrium. Okay, any questions? So that is the capital asset pricing model. You can see that the equation here, the y equals mx plus c, is expected return on the security, whatever security, say etisalat or whatever, is equal to the two points that we use to draw this line, rm minus rf, that is your Gradient, the angle, multiplied by x. x is what? Beta of the security plus c is the intercept, c is rf. So that is the equation for the capital asset pricing model. Yes? Well, it's a, it's a fixed amount for a particular static period of time. So this is the security market line for a period of time. The risk fee rate, the return of the market will be the return at a particular point in time. One is by definition one. So this line is a line for that, that particular period of time. time. Would this, the period this makes a day or a month? Yeah. Or a moment? Correct. It could be a moment. But we don't get a stock market. I mean, you can get stock market indexes. You can see the American Dow Jones moving plus and minus or a day. But I mean, for this, a day is good enough, right? So this is, can be measured on a day time? It can be measured instantly, every time. Yeah, but in decision making. Yeah, in decision making, you will not worry about small fluctuations. Yes. Yeah, but you don't expect. 
absolutely. That's why arbitrage profit is very, very short term. These opportunities don't last long. The whole market observes it, and they will go in. And as they start buying, it will fall. Weighted average? Yes. It is true. It is true. But why, why, do, why, why does it have to be constant? I mean, you're working with future cash flow that are so variable, you're not going to get a big difference. Okay, I mean, these days the company, uh, many, many stockbrokers give you beta calculations by taking averages for the whole year and giving the average beta. And that is good enough for our calculations. Okay, so of this equation, what is the problem equation? Problem is the market return, right? Risk fee rate doesn't change on an instant basis. Beta, you can get the average beta for the company using annual data, uh, using data observations. Okay, so the only one that changes is the market. I mean, look, unless it's an unusual day like when the GFC came, that it went from 13,000 to 8,000, the market doesn't change. It goes up by 100 points, 200 points doesn't make a big difference on your calculation of WAC, okay? That's the only one that has some sort of volatility, okay? Okay, so, so this is the capital asset pricing model. So that's what you have a lot of reading in your notes about it. I have just summarized it. The Y equals e MX plus C is Y equals the return on any particular company. RM minus RF is the two points that you use to draw the SML. Beta J is the beta of the company, and RF is the risk-free rate. So the cost of equity is the same as the return. This is the cost of equity. That's the cost of equity. Okay. There's a lot of discussion about overprice and underprice. But basically, that is the equation that you find here, over here, this equation. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so that's the capital asset pricing model that normally takes a lot of time in universities to follow, but this is the sequence. Get the beta, make sure that your portfolio has at least 15 to 20, uh, 10 to 15 securities, and use it for your calculation of your cost of equity. Okay. Let's take a, oh my God, it's 5.15. Okay, uh, I think we have to move on, no break, huh? till we finish. Okay, let me ask you now a question. Okay, if you have this friendly uncle of yours, who is a bank manager now, not a real estate agent, and you have an existing company, you have lots of projects and all in your company, but you have a new project. So you go to your friendly uncle and say, uncle, can you give me a million dollars for my project? The uncle says, no problem, I can give you a million dollars without any security, and my charge is 10% interest, which is the normal, normal interest rate. Okay, my question is this. What is the cost of capital, the WAC that you're gonna use for that project? Should it be 10%? More than 10%, less than 10%, or sometimes more, sometimes less. So I'm getting the full value of the, of the money where I want from the bank at 10%. And borrowing for the project, 100% borrowing. No, so 10% is the annual rate. Name on the repayment, I'm just asking a simple question, what's my WAC? More than 10%, less than 10%, and so on. More than 10%. Anyone say less than 10% or 10%? I have one person saying more than 10%. Okay, why more than 10%? Yes, 100%, so? So that is, shouldn't that be the, my WAC? I'm getting all debt. 
No depends on the market. Market rate is 10% for debt. So what? Less than 10%? Why? Someone says some say less than 10%, maybe right or maybe wrong, but why? Well, if, it's le if the net present value, if you're using less than 10%, your net present value calculation will be positive, right? But that means your, your project is not earning 10% to return your money to, to the, to the uh, banker. Yes. Why not? The discount rate, the VAC. OK, now all of you haven't given me the key answer. What about equity? Are you not paying your equity shareholders anything? This project is financed by debt, but there are other equity shareholders. I told you there are other projects. Other, there are shareholders. No, no, wait. It's a loan that you get for a project of 10%, but this company has shareholders. Don't they get any benefit of this loan? They should, isn't it? Okay, so we can't, we can't calculate the WAC for a project. We have to calculate WAC for the whole company. Right? Is that clear? Because the shareholders also need a return. Okay, now, what should the... Once again, my question, okay, we know that shareholders are there, so should it be more than 10% or less than 10%? More. Why more? Exactly. Well, shareholders may also accept 10% return. Yeah, they should be more than Why? You're right? Why? Well, why should they expect more? Thank you. Risk. Shareholders are taking more risk. So they want a return higher for the risk. The debt holders are going to get their interest sure. At the time of a liquidation, they are definitely going to get their money first. Shareholders may not get a dividend every year, and at liquidation, they get their money last. So definitely, a shareholder should be asking for a higher return for giving their money than debt holders. It, uh, it makes no sense if the shareholders are willing to take a risk for a lower return. They might as well give it as a debt rather than sh equity. Okay. So shareholders always in a st stable market will require a higher return than debt holders. Always. Okay, now back to my question, therefore. Should it be more than 10% or less than 10%? Definitely more. And you can see this here. It is staring at you. Equity holders will always want more than debt holders. And the cost of capital will be somewhere between these two. More than debt always. Okay. Here it is 8%. Okay. So some of you might be wondering how come equity shareholders want 10% and the cost of capital 8%. The reason is that they are getting the benefit of the low cost debt. Okay, so they can get lever up their return. Okay, so I don't know if you all are unfamiliar with this area because you all are in an area where there is uh, Sharia law, but I'm sure many of your companies are heavily into debt. Is that correct? Or is it financed by the, is it all equity companies, all financed by, by a sheikh or something? You all are into debt, isn't it? Yes. So, so this is very important things to understand. Okay, can we argue that if 8% debt is used to finance a project, the cost of the project is 8%? No, the argument is incorrect. That's the traditional optimum capital structure viewpoint is that there's an optimum point after which both KD and KE rise due to risk. So this is the, the graph that you have, that both KE and KD increase due to risk. 
So we have the, what we call the traditional model that you have the percentage cost versus the percentage leverage. The leverage is your B to S ratio, your debt equity ratio. So at a situation where there's no debt, your cost of equity is equal to your overall cost of capital. Like Apple, if there is debt, the cost of debt will be lower than cost of equity. And after tax, it will be even lower. So as you keep on increasing debt, as you keep on increasing debt, KO will fall. Okay? As, you as you go to 100% debt, KO should equal KD, but that doesn't happen. What happens is as you get to very high levels of debt, your debt holders get scared that you won't be able to pay your interest. Shareholders get scared that the company will liquidate. So your KO will fall up to a point and then go up. So this is KE, KO, KD. So there is some optimal point, some optimal point at which you have the best debt equity ratio at which the KO is the less, least. And if you go back to the model, if your cost is the lowest, your value of the firm will be the highest. The lowest KE, the highest value of the firm. Okay, optimal capital structure. Optimum capital structure. So let us say this is 60%, uh, sorry, 40% borrowing to 60% shares. Then after this point, anything, anytime you want money, if you want to keep the value of the firm the same, you have to borrow in that ratio. Okay, now this model worked for a long time for us. It worked for a long time until we had some people question in this model. So before we do that, let's look at the formula that we've calculated for the moment, the formula. So you have to keep your finger on this particular page. Gearing ratio, the BS ratio is the market value of debt to the market value of equity. The BV ratio, the market value of debt to the market value of the firm. Equity capitalization rate is equity profits to the market value of equity. We've done that, KE. Okay, here's KE. The overall capitalization rate, KO, we've done that, EBI upon V. Uh, no tax situation we've done, EBI upon V. And the equity capitalization multiple is one upon KE, and the overall capitalization multiple is one upon KO. Okay, so now I'm going to, I hope I can wake you up a little bit to show you some magic. Okay, some magic what you can go and do to your company. Okay, so this is enter David Durand, a professor in America in ivory tower, didn't realize about the real world, economist. So he said, okay, what if this curling up doesn't happen? He called this a net income approach. He said that it, it goes on the same, the rates don't change, and he also assumed no taxes. So if the rates don't change, and there's no liquidation risk, as you borrow more and more, KO will fall to KD levels, and the value of the firm will be the highest. So he said, think about that, borrow. So he gave an example of the magic, okay? So he said, let us take a situation where the EBI is 10 million, remember no taxes, this company has 20 million debt at 7%, so equity profits is 8.6. So using KE, this equation here, let's say, say the KE is 12.5%, economists can assume anything. Huh? So he said, assume it's 12.5. We know that the market value of equity is 8.6 divided by 12.5, this equation here. The market value of equity is 68.8. The market value of debt, we've already said is 20 million, so that's 88.8 is the value of the firm which means that if you use the second equation, EBI upon V, EBI upon V, the overall capitalization rate is 11.26. So now he said something that Apple has done. He said, why don't we, Apple has done it this way, but Apple has bought back its own shares. He said, 
let's assume that the company issues 10 million additional debt. So they issue debt, use the money to buy back their shares. Now this is permitted in the USA. Apple didn't issue debt, it used this cash flow from its iPhone to buy back its shares, but let's assume that you borrow 10 million and buy back shares, so they have not invested anything in the asset side, okay? They simply borrowed money and bought back their shares. Okay, so because they have invested in no more assets, the EBI is still 10 million, but now the debt interest has gone up by 10, 2.1. So equity profit is 7.9. Remember, there's no liquidation risk. The KE remains the same at 12.5. So 7.9 divided by 12.5 is 63.2. The debt is now 30, so magic. <clears throat> the value of the company has gone up from 88.8 .8 to 93.2. Isn't that wonderful? You can sit and do no work at all, produce nothing new, okay, don't have any new investment assets, simply borrow money from the bank, buy back your shares, and you've increased the value of the company. So what he was saying was borrow, borrow, borrow. Yes. Right. Yes. You can do better by borrowing even more. But I don't know, in Egypt, it's not allowed to borrow, buy back your shares. Is he talking about buying back? No, I'm not talking about you buy back. Then? As the investor. Uh, no, that's a different, that's a different argument. That he's saying, he's hoping that. Yeah, yeah, okay. But no, forget about that. We are not talking about investor here, okay? Investor, there are so many issues. Do you buy when the market is down so that it may come up and so on? But this one is, if you're a company, how you can manipulate your accounts to, now you can't do this without special permission in Australia and Dubai and so on, you can't buy back your share, but you can do it in the US. But what he's showing is that borrow as much as you can, you can increase the value of the firm. Now, of course, this was an excellent signal for people downtown. Okay, they can do no work at all and increase the value of the firm. The opposite has happened to Apple. Apple has take, got its money and got rid of debt. So that's why the Apple shares have fallen from 700 to 400. When I listen to the, to the news, they say, ah, that's because the investors have no confidence in new products. No, they have simply gone the reverse of this. Rather than borrowing, 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 they've got rid of their borrowing, and of course, the value of the firm has fallen by half. So it's quite interesting to see that, right? So now, while downtown was getting excited about this, the start of financial engineering, for example, uh, uh, okay, start of financial engineering. Now, of course, uh, poor Professor Duran didn't know that downtown was getting excited. He said, okay, forget about that assumption, let's have a different assumption. He called this a net operating income approach, where he said, your borrowing has nothing to do with the value of the firm. Now, completely different assumption. He said, doesn't matter how much you borrow here, if you don't buy any new assets, the value will remain the same. Okay, so remember, forget about the old assumption, now a new assumption, economist. So in this case, if the value of the firm KO remains the same, what it will change, he said, is KE. So he showed that as well, different. So in this case, the KO remains the same at 11%. The market of the company before you borrowed was 10 million divided by 11 percent, 90.91. So different company, yeah, but the same sort of uh, EBI. The market of your debt was 20, so the market of your shares is 70.91. If you borrow more, the market of the company remains the same. 
all that will happen is debt will go up by 10. The debt will go up by 10, and equity will fall by 10 from 70.91 to 60.91. So as a percentage, the new uh, equity, uh, uh, equity profit divided by 60.91 will mean that KE will go from 12.5 to 12.96. So that's essentially what will happen. So the question is, which one is correct? Does it, does it, is it good to borrow, borrow, borrow? Or does it make no sense at all to borrow because the value of the firm remains the same if you don't invest in more assets? So this is a theoretical argument until we had two interesting people called Modigliani and Miller who came into the picture. Now Modigliani and Miller have won Nobel Prizes twice for their work. Okay. So I'm only going to summarize it now given the time. There is a little bit more information in your notes. Modigliani and Miller agreed with the NOI argument. That is, they said there's no value at all if you borrow because the value of the firm is dependent on the assets and not on the gearing. And they had an example in your notes called the arbitrage argument. They said that there's no value for companies borrowing because individuals can borrow and get the same benefit as companies. So there's no point companies borrowing. Of course, there was a lot of, they won a Nobel Prize for that. There were a lot of criticism, mainly because individuals borrowing is at a higher rate than companies, there are costs of borrowing, there are liquidation risks for individuals who have no limited liability, and so on and so forth. So they adjusted for all that, and they said it all doesn't matter, it still doesn't matter, but one thing, the biggest criticism, but they hadn't taken tax into account. So they then put out a second paper, Okay, which agreed with the NI argument. That is, once you adjusted for tax, they said, borrow, 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 because of the tax advantage of borrowing. So now we are into, and they want a Nobel Prize again. Okay, so there's the without tax argument and the with tax argument. Okay, so this is the time, of course, when companies went into crazy mode of what we call LBOs, leveraged buyouts. Borrow, 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 and buy companies. And then we had the huge stock market collapse of the 1987. Okay, now Modigliani had died by then, but I heard Merton Miller, in fact I met Merton Miller by accident in Chicago University, very nice man, I was going to find, see where he was, and he saw, his door was open and he saw me and he said, do you want, then I had a camera which had been taken to do, take pictures of Chicago. He said, do you want to take a picture with me? I said, yes. Okay, very simple, nice man, twice Nobel Prize winner. So, you know, great men, uh, people who don't have any hang-ups, they will say, come, come and take a picture, right? So anyway, basically, uh, Merton Miller said that, you know, everyone is blaming me for the 87 crash, the companies are borrowing and buying. But that is like my wife who blames me because he said that once he was going out for a function and his wife was getting ready and she asked him to check the weather forecast and he went and pressed the button for the TV and the TV went off, the lights of the house went off, the whole of New York went off and three quarters of America went off, which is true, there was a great blackout of America. Okay? So he says his wife still blames him for the blackout because he pressed the button for the TV. Okay? So blaming me for the 87 crash is like my wife blaming me for the blackout. Okay, anyway, the fact is that lots of companies went into leveraged buyouts and they got into trouble. Okay, so let's finish off now. Today, why haven't companies gone for high leverage? Why haven't companies gone for high leverage? Liquidation possibilities increase as leverage increases so it appears that at extreme leverage, we have this curling up effect. It's not straight lines anymore. As extreme leverage is likely to be penalized by investors, debt will cost more and so will equity. So have a look at this, this graph at the end. What do we mean by extreme leverage? Extreme leverage is contextual, cultural, it's country specific. Thus, tax advantage we've lost as debt interest rates increase, thus we are back to the traditional model. So 
this model here looks a bit like this one here, but there's a difference. This optimal capital structure is mathematical. This one is cultural. So those who are thinking you're doing PhDs on culture, have a look at this, okay? Because what it says is that it all depends on the country, right? For example, in Japan, before they had the banking crisis, companies used to go for 90, 95% debt, and still the company did not have any liquidation risk. Why? Because often the Japanese bankers were also in the board of directors of the companies and so on. So they were used to high levels of borrowing by companies. Okay, I know that in countries like Indonesia and Sri Lanka, where there's huge amount of corruption, okay, I mean, the president phones and tells the bank, give these people money, okay, the, the national banks. And they just keep giving, and the large companies are very, very much into huge amounts of debt without any issue on the equity. But in Australia, England, and so on, once you now get past about 30, 40% debt, the bankers get worried, okay? And there is the increase in the cost that they require. So debt covenants are blown and they want higher rates or the money return and all sorts of things. So the point at which this happens could be 40, 50% debt, or in countries like Japan, 90% debt, Sri Lanka, 100% debt, and still there's no, no issue because it's all under control. Okay, so that is essentially what happens. So this is very much cultural. 